Okay. There is one person left out who is in, still in the waiting room. Uh, okay. Uh, hi. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar today. Uh, so um, I will give uh, two instructions before we start the webinar today. Um, so first instruction is how you can ask question. So if you look at your uh, username on the right of the screen, you can see that there is a function called raise hand. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, so then we can, uh, so I will say your uh, username and then I will unmute you and then you can ask your question. Okay. Uh, hi, Amanda. I think there is still one person left out in the waiting room. Um, okay. So uh, the second instruction is that um, please don't worry if you miss any important information during this uh, webinar, because I, I, I think you already know that uh, the webinar is recorded and I will send out the summary of all the important information that the panelists will talk about in the webinar. After this webinar, I will share the documents with you through WISE, so don't worry about it. And I have extra uh, important resources summarized as well. Okay. So those are the two uh, like brief like instructions before we start. So um, now we can start our webinar. So first I want to thank all the WISE associates, uh, Sharon, Sam, and Amanda, and also uh, Shoba. So without your help, I don't think today's webinar will happen. So um, after that, I want to thank they are panelists uh, for volunteering your time and efforts as well. So thank you very much for your time. And now I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, our first panelist is Dr. Den from uh, um, Howard Medical School. And she is actually one of our alumni. She graduated from the biomedical and the chemical engineering department at SU. And now she's an instructor in, uh, instructor in radiology at Harvard Medical School and also a research staff at the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging. And uh, she got her uh, KO1 award last year, so congratulations. So our second panelist is Dr. Senka, and um, she is also an instructor in radiology at Harvard Medical School and a research fellow at the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging. She got her K99 award last year as well. Congratulations, Dr. Senka. And um, the, our, our last panelist is Dr. Wan. Uh, she just got promoted as assistant professor. Congratulations. And uh, she uh, received her K99 award in 2018. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to our panelists. So can you just give a brief introduction on your career path and also your current and future research areas as well? So Bing, Bing can you start? Sure. Thank you, Juan, for the introduction. And thank you for asking you to have me back, virtually back. And uh, yeah, I was a uh, uh, WISE FPP uh, associate many years ago and graduated in 2012. And currently I'm working on uh, optical imaging for breast cancer diagnosis and cerebral monitoring. And um, I actually tried applying K-awards three times. So I tried uh, K99 once and K01 twice. And it's, it's the third time I got it. So I can talk more about my experience. And there's a lot to be said about my experience. Okay, uh, Dr. Senka, can you, sure. can you, yeah. Thank you for having me um, and thank you for organizing this. I think it is, um, it was very helpful for me to attend these type of seminars and webinars be before I uh, applied. So as, as you said, my name is Iqbal. I am working on um, optical imaging for more like neuroimaging application, microscopy. So I was trained as an electrical engineering. I got my PhD from UCLA. And then I did two years of postdoc at Yale School of Medicine. After that, I joined Martino Center and I'm here since 2016. And um, I applied for uh, NIH K99, the brain initiative version. So 
I was lucky to get it in my first trial, but it was the, the very last cycle that I could apply for. Before that, I applied other uh, transition awards, not from NIH. And uh, I would be happy to share the experience that I had as I, as I tried. Okay, one, uh, Dr. Wan, uh, can you start? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. It's my pleasure to be talking about my experience. Uh, so I was trained as an uh, electrical engineer as a bachelor and master degree back in China. And then I got my PhD degree in biomedical engineering at the University of Minnesota in 2014. And after that, I directly came to uh, the Martino Center uh, at the end of uh, 2014 and stayed here for about uh, more, uh, almost six years, two and a half now, I guess. So I, my, I, when I did my PhD, I was trained as a, uh, like, to do biomedical optics that's by developing optical imaging, specifically called optical coherence tomography, and apply the technique for neuroimaging. So currently my research involves continually developing the optical imaging and combine with MR techniques for different applications of neuroimaging. And I'm happy to share more uh, experience about the K99 application when we go uh, forward with the discussion. Okay, great. So uh, just one more thing. If you are not comfortable asking the question like verbally, you can also tap in your question in the chat box. So I can uh, like uh, say your question and ask the question for you. So if this way is easier for you. Okay, so now we can move to our, uh, the, move to move on to the next thing on our agenda, is that uh, first I want to share uh, a screen with you. So that I um, uh, want to share the screen with you about the applications of the, um, or the website of K01 and the K99. So we don't, um, so you know what are, are the things on the website. So we can focus on the questions that are not, that you won't be able to find on the website. Okay, um, so let me see, how can I share the, okay. How can I share the screen? Okay, this one. Okay, so, um, so if you go to the K, uh, like uh, NIH website, um, this is the uh, website of the training grant. So uh, this is the website for K99. And uh, you can, what you can find on the website is that you can find the eligibility. For example, K99, you don't have, be, have to be a citizen to apply. But be careful is that uh, if you are more, uh, more than five or four years in your postdoc, uh, then you are probably not eligible. Uh, and also I have a question. So what does this four year mean? Means that when you are awarded, you cannot be four year, uh, like uh, you can, you cannot be. So if you apply at your fourth year, fourth year of your postdoc, can you still apply when if you when you're awarded that you're already the fifth year? Can you still apply? Yes. Yes. Actually. Okay, well, we can still apply. Your graduation date, your PhD graduation date. If you are, for example, you said if you graduated September two thousand thirteen. So from that, it would be just, uh, if it is before September, plus four years to your graduation date, you can apply in the cycle. Oh, One thing is, okay. if you get uh, feedback, and if you, if you don't get it in that cycle, you cannot reapply. It's just, yeah, it is. Okay. I want to jump in and add something to it. So there are three times in your application. There's application deadline, and there's the review, um, the study session review time, and there's also the project start time. So you need to read the, the program, program announcement to make sure the four year cutoff is whether it's at the time of application or at the time of 
application being reviewed or at the time of the start of the project. So I think for K's, they're either, um, I think it's the, at the time of application, you need to be missing four years. Yeah. yeah, thank you for adding that. That's actually a great point. It was, for me, a bit, I need to be very careful, as I mentioned, it was the last cycle that I could apply for, and it was the application deadline. And I will also add one more thing. Uh, there are also subcategories, there are also um, parent, this is the parent one, this is the BK99. There's also subversions. Some agencies offer uh, specialized K99s, and the eligibility criteria differs in those. For instance, the one that I applied, it is NIN, uh, NINDS. Uh, I mean, not NINDS, it's just um, it's British, so multiple agencies are under it. So the requirement was five years. So I, it wasn't four years after po uh, your PhD degree. So it can differ different uh, from award to award, so pay attention to those other ones because you may be eligible for another one. Unfortunately, that one was not open to non-citizens and non or non-green card holders, so that's a side thing, but yeah, just it's a good idea to pay attention to those details and sub uh, versions of these awards. Okay, great, thank you. So I also have a question is that, um, so is this the only one that a uh, non-citizen can apply for K type of grant? I think it might be because K01 definitely requires uh, citizenship. I think it is. So that's why it's highly competitive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, we are talking about K99. That's the only uh, NIH uh, supported funding for postdocs. Uh, mm -hmm. that if you're not citizen, not green card, you can apply for. That's the only one, which means it's highly competitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. So uh, is this program purpose important? Like, do you have to read it carefully? Yeah, I think different mechanisms are targeted at different um, population. Like, for example, from my experience of K99 and K01, so for KNI, it emphasizes a transition period. So from the, the mandatory K99 phase to the independent K00 phase. So in your, in your application, you want to stress um, how the transition happens. That is a very important part for K99. And on the other hand, for K01, it doesn't require this transition. So your, your scientific research can be an integrity, like one project for four years. And, uh, but, for the training purposes, they emphasize um, additional training needed for the, for the applicant in certain skills. Like for example, I've, I have a background in optical engineering and I'm applying for applications that will give me opportunity to learn more about MR imaging. So that's something you be trained on. So that's K, K1's emphasis. And I think for K23, that's something um, postdoc can also apply, it's not just MDs. So for K23, I actually emphasize uh, going to a new field. So for example, you've been doing like brain imaging, and then you want to go to, for example, public health. So that um, emphasize that, that, um, that part of uh, transition. So that part, the general purposes of the program is important. So you, you want to figure out uh, what suits you the best. And also before you decide which maximum um, for you to apply, you probably want to uh, contact with the PO and see whether they think you, your application was suitable for this mechanism. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, then I think the, the second major section that you can find on the website is the relevant notice. So they, if there is any changes that you can, that uh, they, uh, uh, in terms of these application, you can find it here as well. So the third one, I think it's very important or useful is the uh, guidelines. So I think there are a lot of frequently asked the questions, so you can find it here, and they also have an application guideline. So you can actually read it. And the fourth part that's important is the NIH reporter. I think some of the, um, 
uh, panelists have already emphasized that during, uh, I mean, when they provide the important resources, is that by clicking this one, you can actually find out uh, what are the recently awarded, uh, like K type of grant. But the thing is that you can only find the abstract here or some other information uh, over here. Um, but I think this is an important resource you can find on their website as well. I think, um, and then the last thing I think is important on the website will be the program data outcomes and evaluations. I found this evaluation is very important. At least from my perspective, they tell you how they are going to evaluate your proposal. So you can, I mean, uh, prepare your proposal accordingly. So those are the things that you can find on the website. And in terms of K01, I think uh, the, there is also uh, same thing uh, on their website, but I think you need to pay attention to uh, uh, to the things on the website as well. So I think another useful tool that you can think about is this search tool over here. So you can actually select your role and also the level of your career, and then you can use this function to find the proposal or mechanisms that can help you to identify the what type of proposal you want to submit. So those are the things that you can find on the website. So in terms of here, uh, after that, we move on to the next thing on our agenda is that, um, uh, okay, let me stop here. Okay, well, be two major questions that I asked the panelists. So what are the do's and don'ts during your grant applications? So, can you guys probably talk something about it? Uh, B, you want to start? Okay. Well, I think I already mentioned one thing is before you even start, uh, communicate with the PO and see whether you are eligible for uh, a certain mechanism. And I think the other thing uh, we sh uh, we um, planning for submission is to start early, and uh, especially for K is actually more complicated than R twenty one and R one, because there's recommendation letters and there's uh, in institutional support letters. A lot of things depend on other people's inputs, so you can't control other people's time. So your be best you can do is start reaching out early and start uh, communicating your project ideas with your mentors early so you can came up with the idea together. Um, the other thing um, I guess is to um, also uh, when you have a draft of your application, ask your mentors to read it because they are the ones most familiar with your research. They are point out uh, some technical questions you didn't address in your application, but equally important is to ask one of your colleagues to read the application. Because if you look at the um, study section, not everyone is in your field. So you want to be able to communicate your grant ideas, your science part, with a certain language that's, that everyone can understand. And I think that's, that's important. I guess Nico and Koi can jump in there other things. Okay, so uh, Bing, when you were talking, like uh, you mentioned that uh, you need to talk to the PO, like uh, to kind of like get the information that what type of grants you, your idea will be uh, mm -hmm. like either suitable or eligible. Uh, mm -hmm. But how do you identify which PO that you need to talk to? Well, like for us, like depends on uh, your field and your uh, application, right? If you're doing imaging, most likely it's an IBIB. And if you're uh, uh, applying your imaging material for cancer research, for example, you can apply to uh, NCI, so the National Cancer Institute. So it depends on um, your field, you want to identify a institution unit within uh, NIH you want to submit. And within a certain program announcement, they will have a list of um, program officers at each of the units that you can reach out to regarding your application questions. 
So uh, I reach out to the TO when I have my specific aim page ready so they can see what I'm going to do and what I'm going to propose. And I write to them and I see whether they're interested and whether it's suitable for this mechanism. And it's different, even for K01, for example, NCI, K01 only awarded to under uh, uh, represented uh, scholars. So uh, his, Hispanic and uh, African Americans, those kind of underrepresented population was in the academia can, these people can uh, apply and women can't. So I did, I'm not even qualified to submit K01 to NCI and um, I go for an IVAB. So you would definitely want to talk to PO about this. Uh, Iqbo and Hui, uh, do you want to add anything on top of that? Um, How I, do I you, I didn't. So it is, uh, I, I second what being said actually, starting early is very important. And the first discussion in my case was to discuss with my mentors, I had more than one. <laughs> so, and putting together the specific aims. Once you have that one page document, which was the most effort that I put in, I think that was the very, very important part of the application. Uh, at that point, actually, you look into agencies that you can send your application to. And you look into specific um, funding opportunity announcement that they're called FOAs. So that's the most critical document, that web page that you keep going into. I can just show one. And in that, you can see the program official for that FOA. It is listed there. So you reach out to that person. You email your specific aims. And you said, I think I'm eligible, but do you think it's a good idea? Sometimes they actually take initiative and say, you know what, we are, I mean, your application seems to be more suitable to another agency. Why don't you consider submitting to there? So they actually tell you, they guide you. They're super helpful, most of them, <laughs> at least the ones that I had interacted with. So, and uh, that's one way, just emailing them. But I would say if you, like, before steps are having those discussions with your mentors, because these are mentored awards, all the K awards, right? So you have meetings back and forth. You put on those specific aims, and then, Based on that, if you have that specific aim page, it's a one page thing, you can confidently discuss with the peers. So they tell you, also sometimes you have specific questions just like Bin said about eligibility. For instance, the one that I got, women considered minority in that case. So I applied as, a, as that category. So sometimes- You're lucky. You're lucky. Is, yeah, I'm lucky. <laughs> so, and yeah, that, that was the, first time that the um, version of the grant was open. So it was the very first cycle. There was no one else submitted before us. So that was also unknown, chart, uncharted territory. So we didn't know much. So program officer is the person to contact when you have those type of questions. So they also this four year, five year limit, it can change from person to person. For instance, you had a baby, you had a leave for a certain amount of time, you didn't do research. If you communicate with those people, they can tell you which is counted to your four years, which is not. No one else can you give, give you the direct answer, but those people can. And you write down your specific case, your graduation date, your con like, uh, con whatever you uh, have, like situation, and they guide you. They sometimes send you to different agencies. They tell you whether or not you're eligible. That's their job. So it is very important. Emailing them is one way. People, I also saw people calling them and discussing. I had a phone call discussions with POs. And also, they come to conferences. They have these uh, booths. Uh, they have times that they are actually sitting there in front of the area. So you can just schedule a few minutes and go there and discuss. It doesn't have to be with POs. There are also very helpful people from NIH uh, that are actually willing to discuss and encourage you to apply certain types. And they walk you through the types of awards that you can apply to. So these are uh, points that I thought, yeah, would be uh, important at the early phases. He and Iqbal have already talked about a lot about a lot of those points that I have in my mind and I can't agree more. So there's one more thing that I want to add is uh, the NIH provided different types of 
awards like the R awards, K awards, and P awards, they are for different purposes. Some are for scientific programs, some are for certain, so for a research project. But for K, especially K99, it is about you. You might have a project that you are excited about, that's great, but really the most important thing is about you, how you become, how you want to become an independent investigator. That's the most important thing. So before you apply, you might want to think here that uh, this is, you need to talk about your plans to become independent, which includes your proposed project, uh, your background, uh, basically qualifications, and your training plans, and your career goals. All of the four are equally important. And especially how after the two years mentor period, how you become an independent investigator. That's the most important thing that the PO and the Institute are looking for because you're going to be an independent star and they want to uh, support you and you have to convince them that they can invest their money to support you to be an, uh, to be an independent investigator. So uh, think through how you do through your project through mentor and then become independence. And independence really means some. Uh, I mean, some in some cases it means different differently for dif uh, the requirements is different for different uh, age institutions. So that's why you want to talk with PO. And uh, some institutes say you have to identify how you are different from your mentors in the ind independent phase. And some institutes even requires that uh, uh, you after the two years mentoring period, you have to apply somewhere else. You can't just stay in your same institute in order to get the R00 approved. So beware of those things when you start to apply because that will that affects how you are, how or where you are going to be in two years after you get awarded. So yeah, that's one more thing I want to add. Okay, uh, Mohammed, I'm going to add, uh, unmute you. Okay, um, you can ask your question. Mm -hmm. You can talk now. Yeah. So uh, I was asking the question like. Uh, Suppose I'm working in SU and I want to apply for K99 from, uh, suppose, uh, Cornell or NYU. Can I do that? Is it possible? Um, if I understood correctly, so are you planning to transfer there as a postdoc? No, I'm working like uh, as, as a postdoc in SU and I, I want to apply for K99 from Cornell or NYU, can we do that? Like we can select any other advisor other than our current advisor, no? I have a similar case. I have two mentors listed in my application, in my okay. proposal, I had two mentors. And okay. one of them was, uh, she was a associate professor in another university. Okay. So that, but she also holds an appointment in uh, in Martino Center. So okay. you have to nicely justify that. You can really get the mentorship from your second mentor. So I would strongly advise to have one mentor from your current institute. Okay. And maybe have the other one as an addition. And okay. that's possible because it happened with me. But I also saw cases that physically being apart, like away, if the mm -hmm. committee agree, decides that uh, your mentor you won't be mentored enough by that person because you didn't justify it well in your um, mentor statement or training plan. Mm -hmm. They can reject your application based on that. It is okay. possible. So it's a risk. But so, if you do it well, you can get it. So it's recommended to uh, apply under the current advisor supervision, right? It's, if, it's recommended. Uh, I think I, I think the application need to be submitted from your home institution. For example, if you are currently enrolled at SU, uh -huh. you probably need to apply from SU. As okay. to the mentors, so there's the roles are kind of 
understood differently among different people, right? When you submit, okay. you have a primary mentor and you can have a co-mentor if you can okay, justify okay, okay, okay. why you need a co-mentor. So, so primary, you can primary one of your primary to mm -hmm. whoever you work with currently and co-mentor be someone outside as you. That's okay. Okay, okay, okay. I got your point. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, I, I know a case where she has co-mentors from another um, hospital and mm -hmm. during her our zero zero phase, she actually started a position outside, outside. her, her okay. home position. So that's the level. Okay. Okay, no, one more thing. I'm going to unmute you, okay? Is that okay now? Or oh sorry. One Wait. more thing I want to add is to have a co-mentor different uh in physically different location that so uh, if you specify that as a mentor, you may want to justify that the mentor have time and have resources or ways to mentor you because you're okay. not at the same, in the same location. You're not like meet every day, things like mm -hmm. that. Okay. So those difficulties. Yeah, I agree. You need because, to justify. Um, yeah, because yeah. I have a collaborator who's in London and uh, the reviewer does raise the question about how you can communicate effectively for mentorship. Mm, so right, response right. I added local expert too in addition. So that makes them happy. So physical location definitely is a barrier. And if you decided to add something to it, you have to justify like specifically how are you gonna communicate? For example, yeah. visit his lab twice a year and Skype call every week, something like that. So you have to detail your communication. Okay, gotcha. That's what I did exactly as been said. I actually listed like I will fly there twice a year. We'll have wet meetings and stuff. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mohammed, I'm going to unmute you, okay? I, okay. Oh, sorry? Yeah, I have one you more have, question. Okay. So from academic credential point of view, like uh, how do you uh, define like how many publications are like important and uh, like the quality of publication, how it matters. Number of publication and then quality of publication, how it matters for K99. Well, I think one thing is the PO definitely want to look at your recent publications that you mm -hmm. have at least one or more uh, after you started your postdoc. Uh, okay. And you have publications related to the project that you propose, you are going to propose. That okay. would be ideal and that would be make you strong. So like you should have like one or two publications from your postdoc research other than your grad, right? That, that's ideal. That's yeah. what I heard. I think that's, okay. that's what I heard. The rule of thumb is to have one or two first author paper within the current lab you're working at, like mm -hmm. your mentor. So when you submit, okay. so that's, a, that's, that's enough. Okay. And okay. if you select collaborators or co-mentors, if you have papers with them, that's great. If not, I don't think that's a big deal. Okay, okay, got it. Mm -hmm. So Thank if you, you have uh, publications on the pipeline, about mm -hmm. to be submitted, just submitted, mm -hmm. just mention them in your uh, application. So okay. that can also strengthen. For instance, one publication was delayed for certain reasons. Mm -hmm. You can mention that because okay. uh, the evaluation criteria are clearly listed in FOAs. And one of those important chunks is they evaluate you as an okay. applicant. So okay. among those, I mean, there are items that they check on when they read your publication. One is, I mean, your application. So one is your publication record. Mm -hmm. Your, because as Hue mentioned earlier, they are investing in you specifically, especially in K99 version. So mm -hmm. they want to, to make sure that you are capable, your research record is strong, mm -hmm. so they can invest in you. So you have to convince, you have to structure your proposal in a way that you are someone who is trustable, who will be able to carry out this research and has, has been productive research-wise. So right. that's one thing. And okay. uh, it is not a strict rule, the number of publication thing. So okay. if you put it, I've heard from people who didn't have publications actually got it, but, but they had specific cases. So as I said, most of the time, I mean, there's no hard written core, but one to two is usually what people expect. Okay, okay, thank you. 
Okay, great, Mohamed. Thank you. So yeah. I have to emphasize that I'm a facilitator here. Okay, please ask the questions as mu as many as you can, so we can make the most out of this webinar. So this webinar is for you. It's not for me. Okay. Uh, so I encourage you to ask any question you want, so we can we can get the uh, most the questions answered. Okay. Uh, that's great. Uh, so you have mentioned that you want you want us to you recommend us to start early. What is the general like timeline that you guys used for during your writing of your proposal? I know some of you probably has applied twice or uh, some of you got it for the first time. And what is the most efficient timeline that you guys use to guide your proposal writing? I think I started late than I should have been, but I uh, I guess you, when you start your application, you really need to allocate a dedicated time, which is kind of uh, took my my all day's work uh, during that during that month. I spent almost a month just uh, working on the application and the application related things like generating data and uh, and uh, generating preliminary results and do the writing part. So, uh, so I, well, I guess it would be better if you can think about it three months before you're going to submit and uh, uh, write down specific aims uh, starting from that and then really work on it during the last two, uh, during uh, for a two month period. And being said that there's also internal deadlines for uh, for like different parts of the application package. For example, the administrative uh, part of your application that usually requires internal review and several runs by your institute, and that is required to be submitted way earlier than uh, your formal application deadline. Maybe even one month early. So just be prepared to start those early. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, uh -huh. I think I agree with Hui. Yeah, I was just looking at my application um, package and sorted by time. I think the first, the initial submission, I spent like two months from beginning, beginning working on the first piece of my application. And then when I do the R01, uh, the K01, that's basically recycled the K99s, it took like a month and then the resubmission took take two weeks. So um, the other thing to consider is uh, like for K99, there's uh, um, uh, eligibility issue for four years and you need to really think about, you need to plan your in initial submission that will give you a chance to resubmit within that four years. So for example, if you submit in the June cycle and your application will be reviewed in October, although in October um, there is a submission, new submission uh, opportunity, but your review comments won't be get back in time. So basically you'll miss the October or November cycle. So if you submit in June, your resubmission will be the March next year. So take that into account and that all eat up your four year eligibility criteria. So that's another reason to think about it early. So make sure you have a resubmission chance. I agree with Bin and Hui. That's exactly, actually I agree with Hui. I wish I had more time, but mine also took roughly three months to put together and submit. Uh, but you, okay, I wanna just quickly share one, um, screen very quickly to so you have so many items to complete and those uh, administrative um, well, okay Iqbal, you can just click on share screen yes that's what I try but I actually don't have it <laughs> Oh, you don't have it? I, I so, totally no, no, also I have it. It's just it didn't didn't show the file. Oh, there we go. Sorry. It was just not good enough. <laughs> so for instance, here is one checklist that our administrative 
office share with us. So there are so many items that you don't anticipate for at the beginning and they have these deadlines like 20 business days before NIH deadline. So once you start doing that, like, so there are so many, uh, so it's not only the research part that you will put together, especially if you're doing the K99, the training aspect is also very long. You have to draft your letters, you have to uh, draft the training plan, your mentor statement. So there is so much to work on. So two months is barely enough when you really focus on it. So you have to click so many of them, although they don't, uh, at first, they don't seem to be much, but they add up together. And if it is a specific one that you will uh, end up applying, they sometimes have additional components, like how your research fits uh, into this institution's specific like um, aims. Like they have some goals, how your research proposal actually answers those needs. So you have to address that, a page to page document, they add up. All, and also, if you are a, a diverse member, you have to also page to to justify that. So all those actually come together. Another point in time that considering is you will put together a support team in the early phases of your application, which means you will have your mentor or mentors, you will have your collaborators, you will have your um, other, there are also other types, like you can have um, advisors, just academic advisors, they're not gonna really involve in your research, but they will advise you academically because especially this K99, the project is important, but your training is equally important. So they actually uh, evaluated 50-50 importance. So you have to put a lot of efforts and thoughts into how to construct your plan, that what are, are there classes that you will take? Are there uh, specific trainings that you will, are you going to visit labs to learn certain techniques and stuff? So you have to put those plans nicely, neatly together. So, and the team that I was mentioning, that support team, sometimes it's very crowded. All those people need to provide you letters and that take time because you cannot control their schedule, right? Please plan ahead those as well. So the earlier, the better. And one other, other thing that to consider, if you're in early phases of your postdoc, um, of course, uh, in your research the project part, in the core part, you will need to add some preliminary results. That's usually what makes your application stronger. And those experiments, it needs to be already completed by new, or just only polishing things. Because while you're writing, it's really, you cannot really collect data or I mean, you can, but it's not ideal. So also uh, what I'm trying to say is, it is not that early if you're in the first years of your postdoc to think about collecting preliminary results, to discuss that with your mentors and trying to put things on the side and saying that I may in the future can use this as preliminary results. So it's never early. Just, I think that's my ending statement. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Igbo, just to give you some like, idea the workload so don't think the 12 page career development plan and the research that's everything so i have two mentors one primary one co-mentor and four collaborators so that's six people and then you need supporting letter from uh three references and then you need a support yeah, letter right. from your institution so that that's 10 letters you need to write in addition to whatever uh, you're writing your science and so that's the whole package can easily take months, especially those supporting letters, just talking about how do you like describe your work from all these different angles in different languages is really like challenging for me at least. Right, you might you might have heard that being said you need to write 10 letters. So that's you write, mm -hmm. you actually start with a draft. Uh, in my case, I'm lucky that uh, almost half of my recommendation letters were directly from my rec from the person who did the recommendation so i didn't need to write that much but uh, you probably but uh, in, uh, some of you you might need to write every single letter as a start so mm -hmm. yeah then 10 letters are allowed to write yeah. and one thing maybe just 
one sentence to add is your team needs to be somehow complementary and supporting your application. So the parts that you will probably edit in those letters, if you already have drafts are like how, for instance, I have one collaborator who is providing me the dye that I'm using for, for imaging. It's a very specific dye. So he needs to write down that statement saying that I actually uh, promise for all her career, I will continue supplementing that. And I very strongly support her uh, career development, stuff like that. So they have to, like, like puzzle pieces, come together to coherently to give the impression that you really have all the support that you need. This is great. So actually, uh, a follow-up question is that uh, you all mentioned that the training or mentoring part is really important. When I was talking to some postdocs in, in, at SU, they're all confused about what should be included in the mentoring plan, which you think is like counting half of the K application, right? When you are writing it, what are the key bullets or what are the key components you need to include in the career development plan? Um. I think like your career development plan and your research together is 12 pages. I don't know about Ifo and Hui, but this is how I organize my application. I dedicate four pages to my career development plan and eight pages to my science. And among that four pages, I have one page talking about um, my candidate background that basically nothing you can change, just put down whatever you have. And then the rest three pages I spent, um, uh, I think two thirds of page talking about my career goal and um, uh, a sort of page talking about what uh, my long-term, um, uh, long-term, not long-term, like short-term and long-term outcome of the research and how would that help me to reach my career goal. And then the rest two pages is very, very detailed description of how do you interact with your mentors and what kind of courses you're going to attend and what kind of training you're going to receive for um for your uh proposed research so those are and also how do you evaluate the progress of your project so those kind of things are um what i put in there so k99 award specifically is that uh, independent award as a pathway to independent. The pathway really means that uh, you need more time and more training to become independent in addition to the training and the project that you have completed, which indicates or which really means that you want to expand your research area, you want to expand your, you want to gain some new expertise that you can really complement your current experience to become fully uh, conduct your research program in the future. So the mentors uh, basically want to identify some experts that you want to gain experts from them. And that's outside your current training zone. So basically you want to expand your research to that area and you want to identify mentors from them. Uh, if that helps. And uh, uh, it is advisable that if you, you want to do some training complement to the area that you already um, quite familiar with. For example, if you have engineering background, you may want a mentor from uh, biological applications or like uh, uh, clinical applications. If you are on the theory side, you may want to identify like uh, engineering a mentor from engineering background, or if you are from a total application side, you want to maybe identify a scientist with theory background. So that together you put a team uh, that make you mostly multidisciplinary and that gives you a stronger background, a solid, more solid background. So um, one thing that I may add, once we talk like that, it may blur out the difference, but there are two types of uh, parts. So one is the candidate part. So you have to construct it just like being mentioned. So you give background and you give two, it all, the second part is actually almost two part, which is you mention the things that you will specifically do for this 
project like science files you will take classes like uh, you will or learn techniques and stuff but also just career advice for instance you will take grant writing classes you will take uh, i don't know negotiation classes like you will apply because you will put together a faculty application package and stuff like that you write down all of these and one thing that it was actually very beneficial comment for i heard from previous awardees and uh, people that applied is putting a small timetable just make it very easy to read to the readers to the person who is going to evaluate your application so put a chart with months or or years and then list bullet point all the aims that you're like maybe i shouldn't say aims but uh, like chunk uh, divided into uh, task like items that you will take classes you will learn these techniques or you will I don't know, all those items, just try to spell out in detail, as, as detailed as possible, and mark the area, like when exactly during this award period that you will accomplish these. So they, when they look at your application, they will see, oh, she has a plan. Really, she has all laid it out, so she will just work towards that. So that really helps. At the beginning, I was saying a second part, there's also the mentor statement. So your mentor, it's a lengthy, I think it's a six page document, he or she, they need to tell in detail how they're gonna mentor you. That involves that you will be sent to different labs to learn certain techniques, you will take classes, how many times he or she is going to meet with you to discuss your results, how many conferences that that person is going to send you, or uh, how are you going to go into your transition? Actually, it's also another very important document from the perspective that we emphasize, transitioning to independence part. So that person needs to write down clearly that he or she is okay with you taking down taking that project that you are proposing in your proposal with you so she, your mentor is perfectly fine with you continuing that research so who are, people who are evaluating your application wants to see that you are supported so you will be just uh, encouraged to take on that research so those are usually the uh, parts that your mentor will lay out in his or her statement so i saw a few questions are we good i mean if um, i just want to add quickly add to what okay. equal just said i agree uh, once i have heard people are saying um the more detail in the career development plan the better so use bullet points to list the course number the course name yeah. and the course object uh abstract that you're going to take during your training period and also I use bullet points to list the meeting time down to like which, which time, what time, at which days, at where uh, I will meet with this mentor. So that's something very down to detail and they actually read it. Actually one of the common from the reviewers saying, oh, you're not meeting this mentor, I think uh, frequently enough because I think that's a critical skill you need to learn. So they actually read those very carefully. And the other thing I want to uh, add is career development training, make it part of your training plan. So, so attending seminar for grant mastership, how to write the grants and those kind of things. Uh, that's also what they're looking for because over after all, this is a um, career development plan, right? They want you to be trained on those kind of um, grant management skills in, in the long term. Okay, so there are two questions asked in the chat chat box. One question is from uh, SJE MacBook Two to uh, so uh, his or her question is how much preliminary data do you need? Can you give an example? Okay, I can uh, say. Oh, sorry. Okay. It seems that I have to go very soon. Maybe I'll, I'll just start with this one and then you, you two can add more. Uh, so, I, well, the, the reviewer really want to, or the NIH really want to say that you are qualified to perform the projects that you're proposing. It's not just something in your mind, to, uh, but they need to, they need proof. So for that reason, they need some preliminary data. Uh, it's not that as strict as the R1, you need to have a lot in order to conduct this project. But uh, uh, for example, if you want to 
uh, develop an instrument you want to maybe you want to show some prototype if you propose an experiment you uh, or, or some some important science questions you want to at least do some experiment to show that you have the capability to do that what you are proposing so that and if you have one publication that's related to the project that you're proposing that would be a plus okay i just want to say thank you Hui, for coming today okay if you need to leave at three o'clock please feel free to go okay if uh, do you mind if i contact you if there is any follow-up questions and no problem you will have my email address and just feel free to uh follow up with me or anyone in the audience uh, they can have my contact as well if they have questions they want to ask okay thank you very much thank you very nice meeting you all bye way bye bye way you too mm -hmm. bye so Ikabo, do you want to follow up with that question mm -hmm. or Actually, i agree with way one addition that i would say is try to balance it in a way that uh, showing that you can do this you have the means to do it you did some other version and or some less version of it already and you show it so that proves that you can uh, but don't go all the way to the end. I also had uh, heard cases that people show they almost did the uh, job that they're proposing to. So it's a scale, right? That you can do it versus you already did it. So you probably already close to sometimes like that. Uh, even even so, like try to balance in a way that it shows that you can do, but don't give the impression that you already did what you're proposing. <laughs> Just in a balanced way. Okay, good. So Carla asked the question is, how many years does the K99 last? I think it's K99, right? How does it help you in the transition and does it provide supplies or equipment to start like your own lab after you are independent? So I think maybe the best person for the second part of the question was Hui because she already is uh, getting the R00 phase of it being promoted to assistant yes, professor but yes it uh, actually supports you for the supplies equipment you have so for your it lasts for five years in, in theory i don't know if there is extension i think if you have specific cases and some life events you can ask for extensions so your mentored phase is what's called the k99 phase so that part is uh, two years normally at least one year so you can it cannot be shorter than one year but it can be less than two years that's one thing and for the r00 so in during that part your salary is covered and you have a small uh, modest <laughs> uh, research support as well that you can purchase some equipment that will allow you to get uh, some experiments done but you will already be supported by your so Another thing actually that needs to be added to your mentor's statement saying that your mentor actually will help you. It uh, purchases supplies and stuff. So that actually needs to be there too. So mostly you'll be supported with whatever you are already being supported, but you will have some. You will be able to purchase some. Uh, and you will have uh, travel support for conferences, uh, submissions of papers and stuff like that. So it's a nice one. For our zero zero phase, you will have much more research support. So actually it makes you very attractive, ideally, <laughs> to universities that are planning to hire you because you're already going there with your money. That will help you start your lab. One thing that POs actually emphasize a lot is it doesn't, it doesn't replace the startup that the institution that you will start your, uh, that you will start your uh, independent position they will offer you a startup package. It doesn't replace that. It's actually complement that. And POs do not like it. Uh, so they they don't like the, probably they've seen this, uh, the idea you already have support from NIH, so we will give you a smaller startup package. When they hear that, actually they don't like you to go there. So you have to discuss, so you have to apply for positions. You need to get a, a position accepted as an assistant professor. It cannot be like research assistant professor or junior positions that it has to be proven that you have to be independent in that place. 
it can be in your home institution, but you have to be more rigorous, uh, like proving that you're really ind independent there. Uh, and then uh, they need to approve that. Actually, NIH needs to approve uh, your institution that you get acceptance for. They, because they invest you, they don't want all those uh, investment go wasted. So they have a say in that because the award, the K99 or R00, actually you're not owner of the award. Your institution is the owner of the award. So the institution takes the award, they give it to you. So it's a, uh, I hope it answered the question. Yeah, I think um, just as Iqbal said, um, the R00 part is not in place of whatever start package you're going to negotiate once your future institution. They're, they're still, uh, they should support your research and give you startup package that um, you should go for. And uh, also, um, I think from uh, K99 to R00, it's not automatic transition. So our so NIH ought to actually have a say uh, whether they are happy with your negotiated results. So you want to uh, have the support from your future institution to to come uh, to supplement your research too. Yeah. Okay, great. So we have to move on to the questions that attendees submitted uh, during the uh, registration. So Eastu Park, uh, hope I. Uh, said your name correctly. As the question is the pros and cons of pursuing K awards as compared to R awards. So um, can you enlighten this question? I didn't apply for R awards uh, because I, you cannot actually as a postdoc. <laughs> That's one thing. So one maybe pro of K awards is postdocs can apply for those because they are training grants. So, but ours are, of course, they're huge compared to like budget-wise. They're very big compared to what K can afford. But they also require more comprehensive research plan, lots of preliminary data. So that's one pro and con that we can discuss. But you can only apply those when you're an independent person. Uh, yeah, I think those are three that I can mention. Yeah, I think, yeah, the, the major difference is the eligibility issue. For R, you need to be an established investigator to be able to apply. Yeah. At least at M MGH, they have also have internal guidelines, like they prevent postdocs from submitting to R grants here. Mm -hmm. I know the situation in uh, SU. But R rewards depends on which kind of maximum. R01, just as um, Ifo said, is much bigger grant but also require a significant amount of preliminary data and your established status. So if you want to apply to R01, you probably need to take many years before you can get to that status to, to submit. Whereas in K, you can probably start sub submitting to K like two years after graduation, graduation. So that will give you a cre your career and project an earlier start point if mm -hmm. you're applying to K. And there are smaller R awards like R21 and R, R03. So I think uh, their success rate is not compared, it's not necessarily better than K awards actually, especially R21 is very competitive and people often mistake an R21 as the entry level grant that uh, early career uh, scientists should apply. I think that's uh, something uh, should be reconsidered because R21 is getting more and more competitive and they're not gonna give you a percentile and the defined pay line. And they actually give you an impact score and the, the, uh, the NIH have a say which priority they have to, to support the applications. So it's a tricky mechanism. R03 has better success rate, I think overall than R21 but it's just a one year or two year small project. And considering the effort you put in writing a grant, actually, I think smaller grant is harder to write for me. So I think K probably uh, one submission, if you get it for four or five years, is probably a better investment than ROC. I wanna add actually one thing to be, it's a nuance, but since we are talking about ours, which is gonna happen after, probably you get your case, but one important thing to consider maybe 
so once when you when you're applying for K, you actually write down when you plan to submit your R. You mentioned that you plan yes, to I apply for R. Yeah. yeah, I also did that. So you, the big aim is to get your first R01. That's the thing, and you write down which cycle that you plan to apply for it. So all your K is you will collect preliminary data for your R01 application and all. And R21 is they are actually considered high risk, short term. So you can propose something a bit extravagant <laughs> compared to what R0. R00 has to be very solid. It has to be very well constructed. I, I think R21 is a bit, some projects are a bit higher risk, but smaller so they can consider, but they are not easier, <laughs> I would say too. One thing that I heard in one of the NIH sessions was your first R application you will be considered as an early applicant, early career person. And you get some actually encouragement from NIH for it is being your first R application. You get some uh, boost in your impact score. And it is very important to use that, I think with a bigger grant has been suggested. So I would suggest to go, that's what I plan to do. <laughs> I would, I'm just yeah, actually sharing mm -hmm. my plan with you. I yeah. wanna just use that uh, benefit for an R01 because it's bigger. So I don't wanna, uh, I'll probably apply for smaller R grants as well, but I wanna use that initiative, so that boost in your impact score for an R01. So yeah. that's one nuance that I wanna add. Yeah, the early uh, investigator uh, status advantage only applies to R01. <laughs> so if you apply to R03 or R21, it doesn't matter. And that status is valid uh, after 10 years of your terminal degree. So you have much more time to work on that, your first uh, R01 project than the first K because it has four or five years of limitation after the terminal degree. So time-wise from K to R is kind of a natural choice. But if you pass the eligibility for K, um, of course you can go for R03, R21. And if you have substantial preliminary data, you can go for R01. So, that's all depends on what stage of your career you're at, I think. And I think so. Uh, Cora one, asked, yeah. I think one uh, comes uh, disadvantage of K is that you they require a certain effort. So you you you're required to guarantee at least seventy five percent of your effort on your K project, and so that uh, introduced some. Um, inflexibility as to budget because those are smaller projects and you can uh you only have 25 percent of um flexibility on other projects you're developing so that's kind of a little bit downside but it's not a huge problem okay so carla has a question when does the early career status end 10 years Okay. And uh, if so I, yeah, actually, I, mean, I heard. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, pro, uh, it may be changed. This was some time ago, and I didn't check the requirements again because it's not my immediate thing. But it, it was only that support in that boost in your uh, impact. It was only for one application during that period. So I'm not sure if uh, you may need oh. to go back and read those announcements again. And from what I heard, it was uh, it can be any R award. So they actually, the PO that was giving the speech, he encouraged us to use it for towards an R01, so. Okay, yeah, sure, But that I would definitely. encourage you to go to NIH website and read the details. If I find out the announcement, if there's an update, I can share the link, but currently I don't know from top of my head the details. Yeah, the policies changes all the time. Wow. Like like the K award, the, the guaranteed effort, 75%, they actually recently loosen it to 50% for the oh. later two years if you have your own R grant um, as a PI. So the policy is constantly changing. Definitely go back to uh, check the announcement from the NIH. And I also heard something um, from one of my colleagues. He's running out of the 10 year um, early career uh, investigator uh, status but he said they're extending it to additional year. Um, something like, I don't know exactly the details, but there's a possibility that you can still use it beyond 10 years, but I, I don't know um, the specific uh, announcement from the edge. I'll share the link if I find it. 
Okay, thank you. So there is another question from Patricia Goodhine. Is what do you wish you know, you knew or did during the final years of your graduate programs to prepare for or be more competitive for a K grant? What do you wish you knew or did during the final years of your graduate program to prepare for or be more competitive for a K grant? I would say publication. <laughs> That's the only thing. That's um, a great thing. I think. Yeah, they care. That's that's how they determine whether you're productive or not. I second okay. that definitely. Publications and having a stronger uh, dissertation is definitely helpful. That's your solid plan. Another thing is just familiarize with the terminology. Most of the graduates, I mean. I don't know, I think they are more educated. Try to attend those seminars, those they're so far away. It's, it's very important. And there are also mechanisms. I think, Ikabo, you are breaking up a little bit. Yeah, yeah I just connected. Uh, okay. I think, oh, oh now so it's was fine. Before, I don't yeah. know how much you lost. Okay, I yeah. was mentioning the another uh -huh. mechanism that's not uh -huh. K, but that's called F, and they have an uh, F99. That uh -huh. is, yeah. uh, instead of transitioning from postdoc to faculty position, it's actually a transition to postdoc position. So if you are eligible, please pay to those. And most of the time, if you are a citizen and or a, a resident, you can actually uh, take advantage of awards to postdocs and faculties. You have some early versions of those as well. Please pay attention to those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank I you. agree with equal too. Like, in addition to um, publication, um, like if you can get some small awards, like even like a year, even within SU or from foundation, Mm -hmm. Those kind of support is good, and it's good uh, on your bio sketch that shows you have uh, the experience leading a, a research co uh, a research project. So that's definitely a plus too. Okay, great. So uh, another question from Sam uh, Samantha Jen England is that uh, how did they develop their research? Or how do you develop your research questions? Is it related to the work of your postdoc advisor? And if so, how and when did you discuss with your advisor how they could make this work on your own, uh, like your own work, and how they could generate preliminary data? If it is not related to the work of your, uh, your postdoc advisor, how did you negotiate to find time and resources to generate your preliminary data? Do you get it? Basically, I think she was asking yeah. how your, the, the work you are proposing is related to your postdoc's advisor's work and then uh, how similar it could be and how early you need to talk to your postdoc advisor and mm -hmm. something. Yeah, I think the, the, uh, the project you proposed, because it, it has something about uh, your background and you're proposing something you need additional training on. So it won't be exactly the same as you're being working on in your current lab, but it definitely should be come from uh, what you've been working on. So, so, so that the project you propose matches with your background so you can successfully carry out the project. At the same time, you're pos proposing something to learn along the way to um, to strengthen your skill sets. And that's another reason I think it's important to start planning for K application early so you can start the conversation with your mentors and see um, what, how do you um, uh, set up the research questions that is related to your current work but also distant enough from your current mentor. So I agree with Ben. I actually think exactly the same. One addition that I would do, the first time that I mentioned the K 
my intent to apply for KBAS during interview <laughs> to my mentor. So as early as that, actually, uh, as I was interviewing for the post position that I was going to, in, I, I mentioned him that I have intention. So discuss before you put all the effort writing down anything to make sure that you have an agreement with your mentor. Because if you don't, that's gonna that's gonna cause some issues later on. And uh, in, I agree, it will have some components from your own background. You will have some directions that's gonna open up, but it will have basis in your, most of the time it will have basis to the work that you have in your current lab because it is mentioned as mentored phase. So your mentor should have some contribution to it. That's also Oh, okay. Uh, great. Thank you. So, uh, so Mohand actually has another question is that uh, she think being is working in a imaging field as well. So he is also working in a live cell imaging and a protein to protein interaction. Can you give him some idea to find out the program officer in the uh, in NIH? I think um we're uh, from Matino Center. Matino Center is focused on imaging, and I think we're all we all have experience with imaging. Um, as to um, it depends on your application, right? Um, if you your cell imaging is for uh, cancer study applications, then you can reach out to PO at NCI. And if it's related with cardiovascular disease, then there's I don't know the, the short for that uh, uh, program officer, but um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Let me see. I can show you how to find the information for the program officer. Okay, so for example, this is the program announcement number. So that I remembered, that's what I applied. So if you Google this PA number, and the first one is the mental research, blah, blah, blah. And you click insight, it will have a list of uh, participating organizations. So these are individual uh, agencies from the NIH that will give you uh, this kind of award. And um, if you scroll down, There's a, if you go to the budget information, they will have a IC specific information. And if you click that link, it will bring you to this table, have the name of each of the, the institute, like the centers within the NIH, and have the scientific program contact information. So these are the POs that will manage this type of, this type of grant within this research center was in the NIH. So for example, if you're looking for um, an IBIB, this will be the program officer you want to contact. And this is, uh, this is the people you want to send your specific name page to and see whether they're interested. Okay, great. Uh, I just want to mention that we will send out evaluation form. Okay, uh, after this uh, uh, webinar, uh, so please remember to check your email. Um, and the uh, we our seminar is going to our webinar is going to end at three thirty. So I just want to thank uh, Yukobo and Bing for uh, for your time and the great efforts. I think you have answered or covered a lot of important questions. I hope our um, members or attendees have got a lot of useful message from this webinar. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, we will share the resources that both Ikebo, Hui, and Bing has sent to me and shared with me with through this webinar. Okay. With that I probably want to. Uh, is there any? Uh, <clears throat> um, I 
so Maham asked the question that uh, can can he have the uh, whole I think Juan is closing. Um, just to answer that question, can have an, you can email me your questions. Yeah, I'm yeah. also sharing my email too. I think Juan can coordinate that and she can send our emails to you guys. If you have any specific questions to ask, you can feel free to reach us. And I think we're putting together um, a shared document that have some uh, resources we find helpful to us. And I think she will also be sharing that link with you guys. And you can have it. I think Juan is starting to join us. This is Amanda. I just want to thank the panelists so much uh, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Um, you're absolutely correct that Juan and I will be compiling the resources discussed today and the samples that you've shared. We really appreciate that. We also have the recording as well. So we'll be putting that together and sharing that. And I think Juan is back. Is Juan back? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, we're glad to have you back. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad it happened by the end of the webinar. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> okay, thank you guys for coming. And um, yeah, like it, like Amanda said, we're going to share all the information with you, don't worry. And if you have any follow-up uh, questions, please feel free to email me and or Amanda. Uh, and maybe the uh, panelists are, will be willing to actually share some thoughts on your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. You. Bye, good luck. Thank you, Juan.